So my brothers and sisters, uh, this of course is a reminder for all of us of the reality of the shortness of this life. No matter how much we may love this life that we live in, the end will eventually come. That's something we have to really realize. And we have to always be thinking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminding us in the Quran that cool enough and die out our mouth. Every soul, every human being, eventually this is the end for him. And in the Lillahi wa Alayhi Rajiun, we are returning back to Allah because we originally we came from Him. So what we should do is preparing ourselves. Every day is a time to make preparation. Once you hear, the preparation is gone. Even what we're saying now, these words we talking about death, we talking about the cabri, the grave, is not for the deceased. All whatever we're saying is not for him, it's for us. Now the words will not benefit the dead people. Now all these people here, whatever good we say will not benefit them. Only what benefit them, what they did in their life. So these words we're talking, they're for us. They're for us to hear and we have to think about it. And we have to change ourselves to prepare. We always remind about the grave. We always remind about the questioning, the munkar and the nakir. To go with you, good amal, that's what will benefit you. Your salat, your Quran, your siyam, your sadaqah, your hajj, your all your all these things so we can be reminded. To the point, let's prepare ourselves. The Prophet said the wise people with hikmah, with wisdom, they remembering the death and they prepare. So let's consider ourselves smart and start thinking about ourselves, what we're doing in our life to prepare for this. The dunya will go. Now our brother, his family, he left behind. Everything he left behind, his deeds, his amal, whatever in his life. So this is what I'm saying, we have to prepare for that. Let's leave when we go. Let's start making now the preparation in our life come to us. So we ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our brother. That is one of the gardens of the paradise. You know the Jannah has many gardens. Al Naim, Al Firdos, you know, a lot of gardens. SubhanAllah. Those gardens of the Jannah, of the Riyadh al Jannah, Fira and Rahmah, for his mercy and forgiveness on our brother. In his shortcoming, in his account, we ask Allah will leave Riyadh and put the Hasanat. Inshallah, I mean. We ask wide and put the fragrance of the nice utter, the fragrance of Jannah. Inshallah. And we ask Allah will make ease. As the Prophet ﷺ said that after the people leave, then the Munkar and Nakir, the angels to answer the questions. Who is your Rabb? Who is your Deen? Who is your Nabi? The Prophet? Who did you follow? So we ask Allah SWT will make easy for our brother to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Brother see his destination and place in the Jannah. Inshallah. Fast and make easy the rest of the way as he returns back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Now the best thing to do for our brother now is to keep praying for him. Always. Ask Allah for the children. The Prophet said when one passes away, all his deeds come to an end except three things that will still benefit. Number one, the sadaqah tajariya. Whatever the sadaqah he gave in his life, that will keep going. And also the beneficial knowledge. He taught his children and he taught someone something beneficial. Long as you practice on that, he gets a reward in that also. He gets a share. And the last is the pious children, the walidin. Allah SWT gave you the, the ability to pray. Remember these things to still benefit him. Make a lot of dua for him, give sadaqah for him. Always remember him, come and visit, make dua. If not, you can make Thank you. So I'll leave you to have some quiet time, inshallah, if you like to. But no one is here, so you have the whole cemetery to yourself, inshallah. Jazakallah, nice meeting you, Thank wonderful you family. Thanks, May Allah give you sabr, inshallah. Inshallah, I mean. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. You, so brother. take it, no problem, you take care, alhamdulillah. And I hope everything went. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, good, good. Take care, alhamdulillah, jazakallah, too. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah.
Yes, bro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting both of you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Again, well, you know me. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Okay, no Appreciate problem. Appreciate your help. No problem. Thank no you. problem. Uh, not officially, no, but I'm going back. How are you going to go drive by? Uh, no, no, I'll, uh, I'll just get an Uber. Oh. Yeah. No problem. I'll be okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, you take care, my brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How's the salat? Wa inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiyoon. Again in the busy supermarket. It is busy. Supermarket is busy. Schools are busy. Places are busy. Busy, busy place is the Makbara, is the cemetery. Cemetery seems another janazah. Here we are today. Just finished up. As I always say, death is an ongoing thing. It keeps coming until it comes to us and it's our time. We were in another section of the cemetery today. We actually are in the back uh, by the road. There's a lot of space there. This family had actually purchased the grave a few days ago. They purchased the grave for dad and mom. And uh, father was in the hospital and passed away. And we had an interesting situation. Uh, they had purchased the grave ahead of time, which is always good. Then you get a particular area that you like. But the problem is, if it's in the winter time like now and the ground is frozen, it took a little extra time to get the grave open. So the grave was not ready yesterday. They wanted to bury it. They wanted to, it was not open, so we could not do. Wa Uh No, I'll call the Uber. Yeah, because I have to go all the way to Columbia. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, you got it. All right, take care. Wa alaikum salam. Could not get the grave open, so the uh, burial was postponed. The uh, ground was so cold, so frozen, and even it was so cold that the uh, digging device, the machine, was frozen and wouldn't start. We tried all day yesterday, tried earlier today, and still it would not work. So we had to call an outside person to come and actually dig that grave. So these are the challenges of the winter time. These are things that are beyond your control. These are things that you can't control. You have no control over them. trying to go off for no reason <laughs> but anyway saying uh, these are issues that you cannot control flow with it as they say until you can uh, get it to work properly now this is our normal section there's actually a few burials uh, here a few days ago and as we see we were all the way in the back way there and uh, people have been This is our normal area where we normally use every day. We have mentioned, and we will mention again, we'll mention again, maybe the last time people did not get the uh, information. This device that is standing beside me, it's so foolish and silly what people think it is. There are people. There are people that think this is a cremation machine. Allahu Akbar. People think this is a device that cremates or burns bodies. Can you imagine? Intellectual people. Why we fall to and waswasa. Why we listen to waswasa of shaitan and foolish people, silly people, ignorant people, foolish minded who speak without knowledge, who speak without wisdom, who speak without understanding. We're not to be people who hear something and run and tell it without verifying it. Even the Quran says to verify it. So people are saying this is a cremating device. After every burial, they burn up the body so they can use the grave. Billah.
You burn up the body and use the grave again. How foolish is that? That does not even sound like something to be done in the intelligent, intellectual, progressive world, like the West. This device is a burner. It's called a burner. It's a grave burner to warm the ground up in order to dig the grave. You see? So this device has to sit on top of the ground for 24 to 48 hours with a constant fuel. It warms the ground. After the ground is warm enough and the steam warms the ground, then the digging device can come and dig the grave. Otherwise, like we just explained, this grave took two days to dig on the other side. You see, it took two days to dig and still was impossible. So without using this device, we cannot bury anybody in the winter. These temperatures have been what? Minus zero. I'm not sure what it is today, but it's cold. So these temperatures are minus zero. So not only is cold to us out on top of the ground, the ground is frozen six to ten feet down. The frost goes down into the ground because of the moisture and the ground freezes underneath. The hardest part is the top, and then as you go down, it gets tough. So it's impossible to dig a grave in the wintertime. So that's what this device is for. It is to warm the ground so that we can dig the graves. As you see, this one is preparing one, and the one over there is preparing one also. You see? So alhamdulillah, this is uh, something to know but not to follow a silly rumor that it's burning up people so we can reuse graves again. I cannot understand so-called intelligent intellectual people that would have this kind of a strange thinking that people are disrespecting the dead people and that we would actually dig somebody up and use a grave again. I do not know where we would get that kind of a bad understanding. But anyway, I know we got to keep on saying it again and again. One or two, three, four times is not going to be enough. So we mention it and we'll have to mention it probably another 99 times. So this is one of those times, just to say it again, that this is a device used to warm the ground and is not used to burn up anybody. And it would be impossible to use anything to burn up anybody in the grave anyway. Let's use some simple logic. There's dirt on top of the vault, the box, the concrete box, the stone box. And the box is closed. So how can you get to the body that's inside the box? You would have to open the box. You see? See how foolish that is again? See, it shows how foolish that is again. It would be impossible to burn up something without opening the box. So you'd have to dig first, not burn first. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. And as I always say, once you people hear this, please be the Nadiran, be the one spreading the good news that you understand and straighten out those people who have that bad understanding. You can explain to them that no, they're not doing that, sister, no brother, they're not doing that. They're not burning up anybody. So, uh, alhamdulillah, just uh, another day here, as we say, at the cemetery. And uh, snowing and cold, so I'm not going to stay here long. Uh, our next janazah will be in this area. As we said, that other janazah was in the back section where the truck is because they had purchased graves ahead of time. So this is our usual normal area. So if anything happens uh, in the next few days, this is where we will be. Alhamdulillah, we'll be in this area here. So Alhamdulillah, uh, what can we say other than uh, the reminder of the Prophet Sallallahu that wise, intelligent people are those who remember death often and prepare for it. This is for all of us. 
let's consider ourselves wise, let's consider ourselves intelligent. So in that case, it means we should be preparing ourselves. We should be preparing for ourselves, for our true destination, and for our real home, just as much as we make effort on this dunya. We make so much effort on this dunya, hayat the dunya, the life of dunya, and we should be making also the same level or amount of preparation for the real life, the real life. And when we come here to the Makbara, I'm sacrificing my time and my health standing in the freezing cold to be an agent of spreading the good news and the advice, the nasiha, ad din al nasiha, the deen is good advice. The foundation of Islam, the foundation of the deen is to spread good advice, to give good news, to give good advice, to give warning, alhamdulillah, to the believers. Tanfa'ul mu'minin, the reminder is beneficial for the believers. So that's why I'm sacrificing my time standing here in the cold when I could be leaving and at home with a nice bowl of soup or uh, subhanallah, a nice uh, cup of hot tea and uh, be among my surroundings of, uh, alhamdulillah, enjoying uh, myself. Hmm, we have a glitch here. I'm not the one to see. I'm nobody. <laughs> Allah Akbar. But uh, I'm sacrificing my time here for the pleasure of reminding myself as well as whoever is taking the time to listen and view all of this. Death is a very profound and a very frightful, a very terrible thing. Subhanallah, the Prophet ﷺ, even how he described the graves, he said, I have not seen anything more horrible or more terrible than the grave. That's why we always pray when we bury our brother or sister that oh Allah make the grave one of the riads of the Jannah, one of the gardens of paradise. Because what is the opposite of the garden of paradise? It is one of the pits or the, the holes of Jahannam. There's only two places, al Akira or Jahannam. And in the end, when we stand before Allah, we're only going to either one of them. We're either going to the Jannah, the Akira, or we'll be headed towards Jahannam. So, this is a very serious issue when we think about death. And we should think about it. It's coming to us all. There's no way to get around it. Death is inevitable and has been decreed for us all. Did not Allah already tell us? Cool enough from that I got them out. Every soul. He didn't say a few. He didn't say a few, one or two, or a special group. Nope. Every soul. That means every human being that has ever been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Adam to the, the last person. Every human being will taste death, even in our belief. Our dear beloved Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam. We believe that also when he returns back to this world to fulfill the rest of his mission, then also he will taste that death also. Subhanallah. So every human being will die. This is the guarantee, this is the proof, this is the knowledge we have. Every human being will taste death. Nobody gets away. Nobody gets out of this life alive. SubhanAllah. So this is something we need to function and think on. We need to have fikr and concern of the reality of death. Just as we buried one person a few minutes ago, one day, also we would be getting buried. That's the reality of this life. And we see people in many different conditions. People are suffering with a lot of issues in the hospitals. People are dealing with the COVID virus. 
people are dealing with strokes, heart attacks, a lot of cancer. These are all the means. These are all the means, but Allah is the doer. This is the qadr of those people. The destiny has come. The end of their life has reached them. But it is all the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has given the mission and the job to the death angel. And when your time is ready, then he comes for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the ability to the death angel that that's his function to come and take the life from the human beings. So this death is an ongoing thing that will continue to the end of time. It will continue to the end of time. And this death is the real reality of this life. Death is the reality of this life. Not these transient things that we take that we think are so precious and so valuable. Like property and money and people and families and loved ones and enjoying a good worldly life. All of these things are transient passing. They are constantly moving and passing away. We're moving and passing away and all these things are moving and passing away also. In fact, they're moving away from us because when you go to the grave, you leave everything behind. You take nothing. You leave everything behind. You leave your house behind, your property, your wealth, your accomplishments, your degrees, all of that. You leave your loving husband, you leave your loving wife, you leave your loving kids. You leave everything behind. You take nothing of this life, of the physical things. Only thing you take with you is your iman and your amal. Whatever the level of your iman, your faith, your belief in Allah, that's what goes with you. And your Amal, your deeds that you have done in your life, that also goes with you. Everything else remains behind. No matter how much you may want them to go, and no matter how much they may want it to go with you. Your wife, perhaps, she would like to go with you, but impossible. It's not her time. Kids, it's not their time. And you may want your wealth to go with you, but no, it will remain behind. Everything remains behind. Subhanallah. So this is just a reminder about this life. Our problem is we take this life too serious. This life is kind of like a joke because it's fake. Wamal hayat the dunya illa mata ugurur. The Rabbil Alameen just clarified and verified what I said. I don't need to use a lot to to do that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has clarified the life of this dunya is a deceiving thing, a deceptive thing, fake, false. This is Hollywood, this is Disneyland, this is Steven Spielberg, this is Lucas Films, this is uh, straight out of Hollywood. That's what this dunya resembles. It is not real. It is a glimpse of fakeness. The Akira is the real place, the real things, the real benefit. It is better for you. The hereafter in the Akira is better. It's much better than this dunya of living 50, 60, 70, 80, maybe 90 years and working hard like a slave, working for someone to make someone else rich, and they make millions and you get pennies. And then when you become old, what we call retire, and they throw you out like throwing out the trash, they suck all your life out of you for 20, 30, 40 years, then they're done with you, then they get someone else in your place. You get a retirement party, and now you can just travel around a little bit, see the world, sit in a rocking chair and rock and watch the grandkids, perhaps end up in an old folks or a senior or assisted living place as you wait for the death angel to come to you. 
Is that the value of this life? Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. This is the reality. We have to think about these things in the real sense. Eating and sleeping and wearing nice clothes and enjoying this life and laughing and talking and just enjoying ourselves. And let us not forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the reality of this world in another sense. He said more or less from the Quran that they value the reality of this life. Of course, it's not the real reality. It's the reality that people have made on it. it says the reality of this life is people boasting and bragging. And the competition of the possessions of this life and children and dunya. So Allah SWT is letting us know that the life is just a place of competition. People struggling and striving to get ahead. Or oh, he's got a Lexus, I need a Mercedes. Or oh, he's got a Mercedes, I need a Rolls Royce. Or oh, he's got one house, I need two houses. Or oh, he's got a $50,000, I need 150000 or uh, he's got two of this, I need four of that. Or uh, he's progressive over here, I need to outdo him over here. Or uh, he's doing that, I need to be doing that. Oh, I'm not as big as he is. Or oh, I'm not doing as much as he is. I have to work harder. I have to step up. What they call it in this society, keeping up with the Joneses. Whatever your neighbor has, you feel inferior, so you strive and work hard to live like him. Is that the reality of life? That's what Allah says. Competition, boasting, and bragging. And this is what we do. We boast and we brag. And I say sometimes we lie. We want people to think we have more than we have and we're doing better, so we lie. We build up. We build it up more than what it really is. So we lie to make it sound like we're progressive and that we're successful and we're not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, boasting and bragging. This is what we do as humans. We boast and we brag and we talk loud about our dunya. Subhanallah. So that's the reality of this life. You see? So the real thing we should be striving for is the real, real life. Which begins in the grave and ends up Yom Qiyamah. When we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we go in the Jannah and we end up in the Akira and we inshallah go into the paradise where there's no more struggling or striving. Everything is perfect. Alhamdulillah. And you have whatever according to your desire. That's the real life. Not this struggling in this life and struggling to get ahead. Subhanallah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa qina adha adha nar. Yes, we take our hasna fi dunya. There is good in this life. Oh Allah, oh our Lord, give us the good of this life. And also give us the good of the hereafter. But the good of the hereafter is much better than the good of this life. The good of this life is only temporary. 50, 60 years working, enjoying, eating, sleeping, families, and then it's over. But the good of the hereafter, the Hassan of Filakira, is that which goes on for forever. Qaladina fiha abadan, without end, no end. No end. You live for forever. You don't have to start counting that, oh, I'm 60, I probably have another 10 years left. No, you don't have to do that in the hereafter. You just go on and on and on forever. Endless bliss. Allahu Akbar. No worries, no struggles, no hardship, everything according to your desire. Just imagine. So we would be foolish to throw that away just for this... 50, 60 years of pleasure when the Akra is waiting for us 
and is beyond our imagination, beyond our true comprehension, and will be pleasing and satisfying Allahu Akbar to us. And remember the Akira is the place to fulfill and satisfy the desires of your nafs. It is the place to fulfill your desires, not this dunya. That's why this dunya has restrictions. Hayat the dunya, sijin al mu'min wa jannat al kafir. This dunya, this worldly life is a paradise, a jannah for the non believer, jannat al kafir. But it is sijin, a prison for the mu'mineen, for the believer. So we have so much restriction. But in the Akhana, there's no restriction. Whatever you desire, according to your nafs, you fulfill over there. How gracious is Allah. Alhamdulillah. So all this is waiting for us. And we have to work for it. By following this deen, by believing in Allah, by following his Rasul, by following his deen. Subhanallah. And live the right life and prepare for one of these graves that we are going to occupy eventually. All of us are going to eventually occupy one. Meaning we all will taste death. Every one of us. Subhanallah. And we will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment to be questioned for how we lived in this life which is what we seem to be missing we seem to live this life like a drug addict who is high on these drugs and intoxicated and is not aware of his surroundings or an alcoholic who is drunk from drinking too much liquor that he also does not even know where he's at otherwise we should realize that there is the questioning before Allah on the day of judgment we have to give account why do we not understand this why we follow our nafs and shaitan and disobey Allah and lazy in our deen and lazy in our ibadah and just do the minimum when we should be so grateful to Allah for what he has given us first with the namat al-islam the blessing of deen to be a Muslim that you know to clean your privates when you go to the bathroom where everybody else is not just and you know to eat normal natural food instead of bats and rats and dogs and snakes subhanallah we should be crying every day out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he created us in the best way and gave us a great understanding of life and give us Islam as our way. Subhanallah. Look at that. We should realize that we have to stand before Allah on the day of judgment. And we have to be questioned. And if we're playing around in this life. And not making the, the right amount of effort. Then what kind of answers will we give? We'll be in trouble. So we should work hard. To try and secure our position on that day. That inshallah it will go easy with us when we stand before Allah. And we have to answer the questions of how we live this life. And we know Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. This is what we understand about him. That he had that level of understanding. That when he used to sit in the dars and the halakha with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet ﷺ would be describing the Jannah and the pleasures of the Jannah. And then he would describe the Jahannam and the torment and the punishments of the Jahannam. And I will say it in Uthman, anhu, he didn't show effect on either one of those. Neither the Jannah nor the Jahannam. So he didn't show fear as if he was afraid. Or as if it bothered him. But he had another characteristic. That whenever he would see the janazah going. Whenever he was around the janazah. 
around the deceased, he would immediately start crying so much that his beard used to get soaking wet. I always put it this way, the way the books describe it, that he was crying hysterically and sobbing until his beard would become soaking wet. And the people used to ask him, Yeah, Uthman, what's happened? What, what, what is this? What's, what's become of you? What effect is the Janaza having? Seeing the Mayyad go by, seeing the procession of the Janaza go by, taking that person to his grave. What effect is this having on you? And he used to say, the Prophet والسلام, he said that the grave is the first of the stages of the akhir, of the hereafter. The grave is the first of the stages of the hereafter. Meaning before you get actually to the Akira and Day of Judgment, you first have to pass through the grave, the stage, the Daraja, the grave. You have to pass through the stage of the grave, the grave. And the world and the life of the grave is a stage. It's the first stage, the first step before you get to the Akira. This is the way Uthman described it. He said, the grave is the first of the stages that lead to the hereafter. If there's any difficulty there, if there's any difficulty, what difficulty could there be in the grave? There's the questioning in the grave. That's it. The hisab of the cover. There is the questioning in the grave. So Uthman is saying, if there's any difficulty in the grave, in the first step or the first stage, then most likely there'll be difficulty the rest of the way. So imagine if you are being punished in your grave, Azab al Qabr, if you're getting Azab al Qabr in your grave, then what do you think's waiting up ahead? What's waiting up ahead when you're already getting tormented and punished in the grave? What is waiting for the individual as soon as he gets to the grave and he's immediately being tormented and punished? So then what would be waiting for him up ahead? Most likely more. The horrors of the day. The horrors of the day of judgment. That's what will be waiting that will be worse than the punishment of the grave. Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. So Uthman, he understood. He had the reality. The grave is the first of the stages of the hereafter. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he came once into the masjid. Sahaba were human beings. They were not malaika. The Ambiya, the prophets, they're humans, they're not angels either. We're all humans in sign. We praise the Sahaba and we say great things about them. Radiallahu anhum wa ajma'in. We say great about that. Radiallahu anhum. We say great things about them. And alhamdulillah, they were great people. But they were human, they were still human beings. So, once the Prophet ﷺ came into the masjid, once, and they were cracking jokes and laughing. You know how we are as humans. Something's funny, we push on each other. Oh man, ha <laughs> whoa, whoa. You know, we get all excited, something is humorous, somebody says something funny, and we're all excited. So the Prophet ﷺ came into the masjid once and found Sahaba like that. They're laughing and kidding around and joking and having a, a good time. And he came in and he said to them, Allahu Akbar, if you knew like I knew, meaning the reality of what's at the end of this life, like the grave. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you knew like I knew, you would laugh less and cry more. 
you would laugh less and cry more. Because what's waiting up ahead, no one really knows. So back to said Uthman, this is that example. He said the grave is the first of the stages of the hereafter, of the Akira. So whatever happens in that grave will kind of decide what's going to happen up ahead the rest of the way. So the Prophet is telling Sahaba, if you knew like I knew what was waiting, you would laugh less and cry more. Subhanallah. So like I'm saying and bringing it to a close is that we have to realize that we have to stand before Allah on the day of judgment and give an account. It's as if we have forgotten or we don't take it serious and we just keep going doing whatever we choose to do as if we are not expecting to stand before Allah and answer. And when will we change and when will we straighten up and when will we right our lives? When will we correct ourselves? We only have the chance now. We don't have later. So, if we're wise, we will stop playing with the life, taking it for granted, and we will start making more preparation. Preparation for our death, the grave, and also for the Akira when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this is the importance of remembering death. This all comes under the portion or the title of remembering death because all of these things are connected with it. So if we're truly wise, we will make preparation. We will remember death sometimes, take some time out of our worldly life, especially the bounties and the na'mat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We will take some time out to remember Allah, to thank Allah, and to remember our destination. Our destination is death. Subhanallah. So, Janazah here today, a little earlier, and uh, Subhanallah, we never know when the next one is coming, could be any time, as of now, Alhamdulillah, I have not heard of anything other than those calls I receive almost every few days. Brother, my dad is on hospice. My mom is coming home from the hospital. They have four stage cancer. They can't do anything for them. So they just came home and we just keep them comfortable. The time could be any time. I get so many calls like this that uh, I receive constantly. But other than that, nothing definite. And I'm hoping it will be quiet for a while. Uh, we all need a little bit of a break, especially on my schedule. And just uh, I want to clarify one thing before I go. The reason I always mention 10 people, 15 people, 20 people, 30 people, 50 people in a row or whatever. That is so that people can come to understand the seriousness of death. We don't understand how much the people are dying. And we don't understand how close death is to us. My purpose in mentioning all these people dying one after another is so that people can think and say, SubhanAllah, a lot of people are dying. And then think about themselves. And I mentioned sometimes people are calling all days of night, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 12 midnight, all day, day after day. And we bury people day after day after day after day. Also a reminder of how, of how much death in our community so that we can remind ourselves and prepare. So that we can prepare ourselves. And for those who think I need help or those who think it's too much for me, no, don't get it twisted. It's not too much for me. 
If it was too much, I know how to put up the flag. I know how to surrender. It's not more than I can handle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never puts more on his servant than he can bear. I am a human. I get tired. I get hungry. I get cold like everyone. So yes, it does get a little overwhelming sometimes. But alhamdulillah, it's not more than I can deal with. I can handle it. So don't think that it's too much for me. I can handle it. If I couldn't handle it, I wouldn't be doing it. If I could not handle it, I would not be doing it because I am not doing for someone. I am doing for the pleasure of Allah. So whatever I do is at my own expense, sacrificing my time where I could be doing things for myself but for the pleasure of Allah and for the service of the Ummah, this is what our dedication is. We heard from someone who said something. And what did he say? None of you is a true believer until he wants for his brother what he wants for himself. I think we know who said that. No one is a true believer unless he wants for his brother what he wants for himself. Don't you want your brother or your sister to get a proper janazah? Don't you want someone to come who's going to care for them and show them some compassion and make sure that they get taken to their grave properly and they get proper washed and they get properly prayed on and they get all of the arkam of the deen and the sharia of janazah? So... You're not a true believer if you don't want for your brother or your sister what you want for yourself. So I surely want that for me. So I'm trying to give it so that reciprocation will come and I will get what I give out. Subhanallah. So, it's not more than I can handle if it was a thousand people in a day. As long as I had time and health and strength, I would be there to do it for the pleasure of Allah. Not for money, not for fame, not to get a pat on the back. Oh, he's a good brother. He's a pious brother. MashaAllah, he's doing so much. No, that's from the people. I don't seek any of that. I'm just an unknown, small, small ant in the system of this thing. So what I do is for the pleasure of Allah and for our community. I don't have wealth to give. I don't have great knowledge to give. So this has been my dedication to the Ummah. We all have to give something. A lot of times people are very selfish. We see people starving. We see people hungry. We see people needy. And we just enjoy. And we don't feel any compassion for those people who maybe are not like us, not our nationality, not our race, and we have no compassion for them. SubhanAllah. So Alhamdulillah, just something to think about. I see sometimes people send messages that uh, it's too overwhelming. I should have a crew, I should have a staff, I should do this and I do that. And so what I say, my new response, even when they say, brother, are you recruiting someone for when you retire or when you, you know, when you move on, have you recruited anybody? Have you groomed anybody? Have you trained anybody? My response to that is, subhanAllah. Well, I had another response, but now my new response is, to that person saying that, I said, are you ready? See, because the person who says that, that's asking, have you recruited someone or trained someone? Someone else, not them. So they should be the ones stepping up because they have the concern. They're worried that what will happen when I'm gone? Okay, then you saying that, are you ready? Don't point the finger to someone else to do. Are you ready? See, this work is not for everybody. Everybody can do it. How many times the son runs away from the father 
The daughter runs away from the mother. Brother, I can't do it. Sister, we need a few people to wash your mom tomorrow. Oh, brother, no, I, I can't do it. I can't see her face. Brother, can you send a few people to wash your dad? We need a few people to help us. Oh, no, brother, I'm afraid. I'm so scared, brother, please. I can't do it, please. Find somebody else. So they run away from their loved ones who they claim to love. You see, so what this means is what? The average person can't do it. The one to do this work will most likely have to be chosen by Allah, as I feel I was. I'm not used to being around the dead people either. As a non-Muslim, I had my great fear of death also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put something in me that took the fear out and gave me the ability to do it. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I believe the number one thing will be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have to kind of choose those people based on perhaps they have the intention and the desire to do it. But it's not for everybody. Everybody can do it. Sometimes the people come in many different positions or situations. Could be shooting, could be stabbing, could be found in the apartment after decomposed body. They found somebody in the apartment, could be after two, three days or so, or weeks. Could be a fire, could be any different uh, things. Contagious diseases. So it's not easy for everybody. So this work will have to be for particular people, not just for anyone who walks in to say, I'm ready, I want to do it. It would have to be kind of a calling. It would have to be a devotion and a dedication. That's the main thing. The person would have to be ready to dedicate his time and make great sacrifice. SubhanAllah. Taking care of our dead. So Alhamdulillah, just to talk on that just for a few minutes. Because people are, seem to always concerned that it's too much for me. As if I can't handle it. No, I can handle it. I've got it. The best thing that you all and the community can do is to, number one, value my life and value what I'm giving and help protect me. Number one, by staying away from the cemetery. That's the number one thing I ask. Stay away from the Mugbara. Please, pass the word. No one is welcome. Let's keep Brother Abdullah safe. Let's not bring 70, 80, 90 people to a janaza. Let's stay away. They're asking us to bring 25 people or less. That's the thing I ask. Don't ask your money. I don't ask your praising me. I ask keep me healthy by staying away from the cemetery. That's what I would love to have. If the people stay away from the cemetery, that will be safer for me and keep me happy and keep me healthy also. So that's what I'm seeking. I'm not looking the money. I'm not looking the praise. None of that. I'm looking to stay healthy. La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. So alhamdulillah, we're going to move out. As you see, it is a what they call a winter wonderland. This is the cemetery in the winter time. Alhamdulillah, this is what it looks like. Snow everywhere. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, going to move out and uh, get back to the city, get back to the warmth. Alhamdulillah, warm up, be ready. I understand maybe six inches more snow might be on the way. Subhanallah. So alhamdulillah, I hope all what we have been talking about today is of some benefit. Alhamdulillah. Especially for those who chose to hang on for such a long video. I apologize for that. But uh, alhamdulillah, I hope we've touched on several issues that are important. Number one being the importance of preparing for death. The importance that we need to work hard to prepare for death. 
which is the reality of this life that could come at any time. So we need to prepare for that. And uh, also the importance of taking standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a, a very important moment that we have to get ready for that. So this is the opportunity to purify ourselves and become better and do those things that are going to benefit us when we stand before Allah and have to be questioned. And also we touched on the burning devices which are warm in the grave, which it is impossible to dig without warming the ground. And as we said, they are not burning up bodies and things like that. And also the removing of people from any grave to use a grave again is not being done. We we'll probably have to keep talking about that for the next hundred years. People have some myth or some misunderstanding that we reuse or recycle graves, which we do not do. So people ask the question, what's going to happen when this cemetery is full? Well, when this cemetery is full, it would be like all cemeteries. It is not usable anymore. When it reaches the last grave, and the last person will go in, then it is not usable again. It will be usable for people to come and make dua and visit their loved ones, of course, so it will still be open, but uh, it will not be open for using anymore once all the graves have been used. And of course, before that happens, then we'll secure another one and uh, there's plenty of room here. The rough estimate looks like it could be between 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, depending on how the landscaping is done. But at least a minimum of 10 or 15 years that we'll still be here. Alhamdulillah. So all those things. Oh, wow.